Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Paul Starobin for America and Beyond, and my guest today is Barry Gouin, who is the author of The Inevitability of Tragedy, Henry Kissinger and His World. So Barry um, was an editor at the New York Times Book Review for 30 years. He's written on politics, international affairs, and culture for publications, including the New York Times, The New Republic, Dissent, and The National Interest. Uh, Welcome to the show, Barry. I'm happy to be here. Talk a little bit about how you came to this subject, to this book. Um, Well, of course, there have been numerous books written on Kissinger. And even when I was um, preparing to write this book in 2018 and 2019, um, I was aware of the fact that there was an enormous literature on the man. Um, But um, there was an editor of a small series of biographies, um, small in both senses, but uh, short biographies of uh, major figures, mainly in the 20th century. Um, And I knew him because of my work at the book review, and he asked me at one point if I'd be interested in doing a short biography of uh, Kissinger, and I said I would. And he said, well, let me talk to the other other editors and get back to you. And so during that time, which was about a month, um, I started reading up on Kissinger, uh, read all the major uh, biographical studies, and of course, some of Kissinger's own work. Um, But when the editor got back to me, he said, um, Barry, I'm sorry, uh, but Uh, the editors feel it's just not the right time for a Kissinger biography. um, And um, so we're not going to go ahead. And, but by that time I had formulated enough ideas about Kissinger that I thought could be interesting to people that I decided uh, to go ahead on my own. Um, And as part of the motivation for doing that, um, the um, people that I tend to know, it's not entirely true by a long shot, but there were enough people that I knew, including a lot of my colleagues at the book review, who simply dismissed Kissinger as a war criminal, and that wasn't my view, that I decided that was another reason to go ahead, if only to tweak my colleagues. Um, Probably my closest friend at the book review uh, could not speak of Henry Kissinger without calling him a war criminal. So, um, (laughs) you know, there there was that. Yeah, Uh, that's always a pride, always a pride for a writer, right? To have that kind of helpful friction. And so I um, uh, plunged in. Now, given my workaday job, I really couldn't do a lot of work on Kissinger. I was really limited to weekends. And so it took me around, I've lost track now, six or seven years Mm -hmm. to complete the book. Um, And people asked me if I had gotten an agent or a publisher. And my answer was no, I wanted to complete the manuscript. I've seen, again, in my work at the book review and among the writers I knew, I had seen too many examples of people who had taken uh, contracts with publishers, in some cases, very hefty contracts, and never delivered the book or, or, or felt enormous pressure. And I didn't want that kind of pressure. So until I had a finished manuscript, I didn't uh, contact agents. Uh, I finally, I did get an agent. Um, we, um, he sent it around. Norton was very interested and offered me an attractive advance, um, even though the manuscript was there already. And, uh, and it went from there. Great, that's great. Um... Yeah, I mean, every book, of course, is its own story of Genesis story, I think. And that's that's an interesting one. I wonder, I mean, Henry Kissinger, of course, is such a well-known figure, at least a figure that people think they uh, know well. And your book is not, of course, a conventional biography, and we're going to get to that. But I wonder, just at this kind of early point, 
Can you give us a kind of a sketch of the the roots of Henry Kissinger, the early life, let's say bringing him up to his entrance into Harvard? He was, um, I, I should say, by the way, <clears throat> that I did lay out a sketch of the background, but mine is not the best book for um, uh, learning about the early years. And if you really do want to learn about the early years, in much more detail than I provide. Um, probably the best uh, source is Neil Ferguson's first volume of his Kissinger biography. He and I have rather different takes on Kissinger as a whole. Um, we know each other and admire each other, but um, um, I, I think differ on, on this and, and other matters. But in any case, um, what struck me, um, when I started plunging into the books and the articles and the research was um, how much I thought his German Jewish background really did affect his thinking overall. There's always an aura or aroma of Weimarian decline in his thinking and he's been criticized by many people, especially on the right for being a declinist. Uh, about America, um, but his, his his approach, I think, in large part, grows out of his experiences as a um, uh, an assimilated German Jew, um, who, of course, then had the ground cut out from under him. When I say he was an assimilated German Jew, there was a um, still a strong emphasis on his Judaism. He went to synagogue, um, but also, I mean, he was an avid sports fan, soccer, um, et cetera. Uh, he always has denied, though we have no reason to believe him, that um, his Jewish background played no real role in his thinking. And in a sense, that's true because he tries to think strategically rather than with any ethnic or partisan uh, perspective. But but it, it's impossible to deny that the Holocaust experience um, affected him. He and his family were able to get out um, mainly because of the shrewdness of his mother. His father was very much a kind of idealist and uh, refused to see the dangers that existed for them. Um, and again, I think this, his, you know, he always loved his father, but I think his own rather harsh realism uh, was a reaction to his father's naivete. And when they arrived in uh, New York and moved to Washington Heights, which was very German Jewish and was known as the Fourth Reich because of its large German Jewish population, um, Kissinger um, uh, really continued to grow up in, in an environment that he was uh, familiar with from, um, from Germany. His father um, really had a hard time adjusting in the United States. This was not unusual for German Jewish families who had moved to the United States. The men had real difficulties adjusting. What was his father? What did his- uh, His father had been a school teacher. A school and teacher. was unable to find work in America as a school teacher. Right, but in Germany, he had been a school teacher. And, 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 and say, Henry, Henry, was, Henry was born in 1923. In, uh, in a town in B Bavaria. It was Firth, which itself was a very Jewish town. It was widely recognized as, as an, uh, an area of toleration, um, very close to Nuremberg, which decidedly was not. Uh, but Henry did grow up in a, um, a rather uh, congenial environment. Though he did encounter anti-Semitism, that was inevitable in Weimar Germany, but... Um, um, he claims, and again, I don't trust him on this, it never really um, 
uh, affected him. His mother tells a somewhat different uh, story about that. In any case, there he was in Washington Heights. At, at what age? At what age did now? Was he in? Do we um, now? And they when? they uh, emigrated in thirty eight. Just just before it became impossible not to. Again, at the mother's urgings, not the father's. And um, he was fifteen. Okay, um, fifteen. Yeah. Um, He had been only a mediocre student in Germany, and um, I'm not sure if he was any more outstanding in the U.S., but his aspirations were very limited. Um, His his goal was to become an accountant. um, um, He wasn't much of a reader in Germany. um, he was a normal kid as far as you could be a normal kid and be a Jew in Weimar, Germany. Um, he had to learn English, of course. He did uh, learn English. He had taken English in Germany. Um, but as we all know, his accent is so strong. Um, what's odd is that his younger brother uh, spoke English un- without an accent. Yes, I saw that detail in the book, and I was struck by, I mean, you know, like, how, how can that be? I mean, it's, it, it's kind but, of... But, but there it is. I mean, people respond to languages differently. On a yes. personal note, I'll say, I've been completely unable to learn a foreign language for which I've been mocked by some of my multilingual friends. But it, it's <laughs> my, my my girlfriend has said it's because I don't listen. But um, um, in well, any that's, case, that's, that is often what a girlfriend might say. <laughs> yes. Um, um, in any case, um, he uh, was still in a largely Jewish environment. Um, and then the war broke out. Yeah. And when the war broke out, he was um, drafted. Um, he did his training in South Carolina. Um, he, it, it, the war experience, which he enjoyed, opened his eyes um, to the larger world. Yeah, that must have been uh, just a, say, culture, say, a, a culture shock of some kind. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but whereas other... Jews, including American Jews, felt a profound culture shock. Um, he actually enjoyed the Middle Americans yeah, that yeah. he had to work with. He found them open. He found them um, um, warm, um, um, brave. You know, whatever adjectives you want to to use. He he came away with a very positive view of middle America. And I have to say again, if we're looking for moments that may have affected his thinking, I think this is one. I think one of the reasons he could get along so well with a middle American like Gerald Ford was that he genuinely enjoyed middle America. And in a way that his later associates at Harvard or the you know the Council on Foreign Policy um, didn't. Um, there, there, there always was that quality of being an outsider that he had, even though his outsiderness was in some way a, an admiration for the very insider Middle Americans. So yeah. you know, there's yeah, there's, that's, well, that's a common. In some ways, it's a common. I mean, it's sort of you know how the Jews invented Hollywood is a title of the book. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely Let's, right. And, That's absolutely right. And, um, and I was I was struck too by the detail uh, on entering Harvard. He actually requested a Midwestern roommate, um, and I wondered whether was there both kind of the attractive element there that he wanted something for the Midwest, and also that I don't know he didn't he didn't want to be with necessarily with somebody who had essentially his you know a similar background. His his Jewish identity is very problematic, and books have been written about it. Um, and it's it's one of those issues that will never really be settled. I mean, what we can say is that he was not a self hating Jew. That that's clear. But but beyond that, um, to what degree he identified as a Jew is. Um, very problematic. Um, When the issue of the um, troubles that the Soviet Jews were having um, on the White House tapes, there's an exchange that he has with um, Nixon, 
in which um, um, the administration is opposing a bill to encourage uh, Jewish emigration. I won't go into the details of why that would been, have been the case, but Kissinger says uh, to Nixon, well, I'm a Jew myself, you know, as you know, I don't know if he said, as you know, but, um, but you know, I'm against uh, pushing Russia on, on this matter. And, and of course, he took flack for that. He also took flack for working with um, Nixon, who was clearly anti-Semitic in his thinking, though it didn't um, affect his choices of who he would uh, work with in his administration. There were many Jews prominent in the administration. Um, and, um, you know, obviously Kissinger. Um, but there's also no denying that, that Nixon had some very, uh, and I'll use the phrase here, uh, middle American um, anti-Semitic uh, uh, elements to him. And again, Kissinger has taken flack for being willing to tolerate that. Um, uh, the reason he did has to do with his conceptions of the role of public officials, and you and I can get into that later if you if you want. And in any case, after the war, uh, with the help of, of um, a mentor or two, he was very successful in his military career because he spoke German and could work with the Germans in post-war Germany and, and had a real uh, kind of understanding and sympathy of, for their condition. Um, he wasn't vengeful. And uh, again, to speak of his Jewish identity, that was something that um, um, was um, he was criticized for. But it, it obviously made sense uh, with defeated Germans. If you're trying to reconstruct some sort of society, you don't want to do it on the basis of vengeance. Right. And, and he and, had some. He was working in some sort of intelligence capacity. Yeah, he right? was ferreting yeah. out. Um, um, unregenerate ex-Nazis, but also working with local officials. I've at this point forgotten the details of that. If you do want those details, Ferguson can provide you with all you need. But um, um, you know, I was I was not interested. Ferguson is writing a multi-volume, probably two-volume uh, biography. He's had access to all the Kissinger. Oh, sure. Sure. Papers. Um, yeah. No, we won't worry about that. So, so he's really getting immersed in the details. My book is much more an intellectual portrait of Kissinger. It's not so much interested in the details of if this happened then and the other happened at another time, as I am in the currents of thought that that he absorbed and 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 represented. Um, and I'll say this also, because I mention it in the acknowledgments, um, Kissinger refused to talk to me um, for the book. And um, I think there were um, two reasons for that. Number one was um, I was working at the New York Times and he had had very, he felt, very bad experiences with the Times. He didn't trust people from the Times. And um, and so that would have been a black mark against me. And um, the other reason, and this is more esoteric, but you may appreciate it. One of the people I wanted to ask him about was the German political philosopher, Carl Schmidt. And Schmidt was an absolutely unregenerate Nazi, an undeniable anti-Semite, but someone who has uh, made real contributions to political thought. Um, other political philosophers like Hans Morgenthau and um, Leo Strauss and, and Hannah Arendt, uh, all of whom feature large in my book, um, uh, I admired Schmidt for for some of his ideas, um, obviously not for the anti-Semitism, but he was a serious political philosopher who is now cited on both the left and the right because of certain ideas he had about how 
how politics work. In any case, I made the mistake of saying, I'd like to talk to you about any ideas you have on Schmidt. I was very innocent. And I'm sure Kissinger saw that as, you know, he already distrusted me for working for the leftist New York Times. And I think Kissinger probably saw that as uh, a way in which I was going to brand him as a Nazi. Um, right. yeah. And, you know, okay. Well, uh, let's, um, yeah. Let's, yeah. I mean, as you make clear, it, the, it's a book of um, of ideas. And let's focus a little bit on, I mean, the subtitle is Henry Kissinger and His World. And you move in that respect from uh, Hitler uh, to Leo Strauss and Hannah Arendt and on to Hans Morgenthau. So let's just take that a little bit in in sequence. I mean, Hitler, of course, is this is the, you know, world that, that he inhabited when he was in Germany. I mean, Hitler's rise kind of coincided with his uh, coming of age. That's right. Years. And that, yeah. How, how did that kind of in, inhabit him at that time? Was it, you know, maybe consciously or, or not consciously? Well, again, he, oh. he claims that he wasn't really affected by that. Um, I don't believe that. His mother suggests that it was uh, not that. I mean, he did try to lead as normal a boyhood as possible, though when he saw uh, groups of German teenagers, you know, thuggish looking teenagers, he would cross to the other side of the street in Firth. Again, remember, Firth is this uh, area of general tolerance, again, which is not to say there isn't anti-Semitism or Nazi thuggery, but that wouldn't have been the um, the dominant strain in his, in his um, life. Um, um, I, I want to back up and say the first chapter um, is about Chile, and I try to lay out all of the reasons why he t pursued the policies that he did toward Chile. But toward the end of that chapter, what I say, and it's what leads into the Hitler chapter, is that um, Kissinger did not, and this is true of all of these German Jewish exiles, did not have a great faith in democracy. This is one of the key elements of my book, and it's one of the key things that distinguishes his thinking on foreign policy and the thinking of people like Hans Morgenthau and Hannah Arendt from the run-of-the-mill American thinking on foreign policy, where democracy is viewed always as a good. I, I think it was... Uh, Fareed Zakaria, though I'm I'm not entirely sure of that, who said Americans have taken a political process that is democracy and turned it into a religion, and and that was not how these German Jews viewed it. Why not? Well, they had a whole continental tradition of suspicion of democracy that went back to Plato and up through uh, Alexis de Tocqueville that uh, unrestrained democracy could lead to demagoguery and thuggery and violation of rights against minorities and aggression against others. And of course, the person who came to embody that aspect of democracy was Adolf Hitler. We have to remember, and I stress in the book, that Adolf Hitler was a democratic politician. He, you know, there are people who deny this, but I think it's special pleading on their part. What, what can't be denied is he was the most popular politician in um, Germany, and he was able to achieve what he achieved through democratic means. Parliament passed um, um, the Enabling Act, which gave Hitler all the power he needed, but it was all done legally. And I, I think these contradictions of democracy have a greater resonance now that we're confronted with the figure of Donald Trump and what a Trumpian uh, legitimate victory in, say, 2024 might mean for our country and might mean for our democracy. I mean, democracy 
is, is a good when it works well, but it can be a danger. Hans Morgenthau, who in some ways is the real hero of my book, said he could never convince Americans that democracy was a problem in Germany during Weimar and, and, and with the rise of Hitler. He could never convince them that Hitler was anything but a tyrant, uh, which plays into the idea that, you know, uh, democracy is good, tyranny is bad, and the two have nothing in common. Well, the political tradition is that they often have a great deal in common. Right. And when you say his world, I mean, What's I mean, just with respect to Leo Strauss and Hannah Arendt, in, in what sense were they part of Kissinger's world? Um, whoops, they 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 weren't exactly, and and this was a a, a problem in the book. I wanted to bring them in. There there are three intellectuals that I think are important to understanding Kissinger's ideas. Hannah Arendt, Leo Strauss, and Hans Morgenthau. Now with Morgenthau, there was a very tight connection and um, Kissinger was in many ways uh, a student of Morgenthau's. Morgenthau really was a kind of mentor toward him and that relationship is very important to understanding the intellectual uh, constructs that Kissinger employed. Right. With just, Aaron, <laughs> Just to say, though, about Morgenthau, people, people for 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 our listeners, I mean, he was what some years older than than than. I him. think it was about fifteen to twenty years old. Right. He came to America, and he is best known for his book, "The Politics Among Nations," and is considered kind of a founder of what we think of as the realist school, sort of the modern, you know, realist school in in foreign policy as a way as sort of as a lens for looking at foreign affairs with an emphasis on national interest and balance of power. He taught for years at the University of Chicago. That was kind of his base. And as I recall from your book, Henry came into contact with him, I think at Harvard. When, That's right. Uh, yeah. So they, was guest teaching at Harvard. Yeah. So this is a personal relationship and also as we can talk about, but, you know, it's sort of foundered uh, on Vietnam to some degree, as so many relationships do. So, but yeah, so you're making this distinction between Morgenthau as a person that Henry knows greatly respects, and then a little bit more in the background, uh, you know, a, a Hannah Arendt and a Leo Strauss. I mean, what would Hannah Arendt have meant to, to Henry Kissinger in terms of his development, I guess, as, as a, a thinker? Well, um, I, I have to say, I'm, I, I'm not sure I handled the Strauss and Arendt sections well, but I didn't see any other way of doing it. Some of my readers have thought that based on those sections that I was saying there was a connection between Kissinger and Arendt and Strauss. And in the case of Arendt, um, the only connection that I found, it comes from her biographer, Kissinger at one point at Harvard was editing a magazine called Confluence and um, um, she wrote an article for Confluence and it was a very bad editing experience. They really did not get along on that. Um, with Leo Strauss, I have found no uh, direct connection between Kissinger and Strauss. Um, so why do I have these two figures in the book? Uh, well, they're in the book to show this general context in which Kissinger grew up, the uh, suspicion of democracy, the ambivalence toward America, the fear that that we were living, that America was living in its own uh, Weimar twilight zone. Um, the the sources of their own ideas and how they may have paralleled uh, Kissinger's own ideas. I did speak to one prominent uh, intellectual historian about this as I was writing the book, and I said, look, I don't have a smoking gun here. I don't have a clear connection between Strauss and Kissinger. And he reassured me and said, Barry, you're writing an intellectual history. You're writing about families of ideas, the kinds of collective beliefs and and um, sources of behavior 
that that these figures may have, even if they didn't come in direct contact. Yeah. Well, I think it made sense in the sense of the history. And this is, I mean, something to bring out about Henry is, is you know, we know him, of course, as a kind of practitioner of power. Um, but before he became such, he was a professor. I mean, he was at Harvard. Do you think of him? Can we think of him as a genuine intellectual? Oh, I do. Um, um, God, this is complicated, too. He, um, I think of him now as the man who has given us a framework that we would be well advised to either adopt or at least uh, consider as we move forward with foreign policy. And that seems to me to be intellectual work. The people he knew um, until later in his life when he became sort of I guess, enamored of the, the billionaires and high society people that he then began to hang out with. But the people that he knew at Harvard were people like uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and um, Arthur Schlesinger. And um, as I say, one of his closest allies uh, was um, Hans Morgenthau. And to say just one more thing about the Morgenthau connection, uh, Morgenthau himself, this is kind of whispering down the lane, Morgenthau himself was very, very close to Hannah Arendt. Now, I don't know if, if Morgenthau ever um, gave a party or you know had a lunch that brought the three of them together. I, I just haven't been able to find that kind of direct connection between them. But Arendt's own ideas, uh, which were very congenial to Morgenthau's, and Morgenthau's ideas, which had a profound um, uh, influence on Kissinger, show, I think, that there really is a, an intellectual connection between all of these figures and that you can draw a line. Yeah, I think you established uh, Kissinger that. and Arendt, for yes, instance. I think you, I think you, I don't establish that. And I think it's, um, for me, the question of the intellectual is, I, I, maybe I just sense a kind of attention there. I mean, I think it was Richard Hofstetter who said, what is an intellectual? It's somebody who enjoys the play of ideas for their own sake, which I've always liked as a kind of, definition. And if we move into a person who is certainly inhabits a world of ideas like Kissinger, but then seems to be supremely interested in operating on them as a kind of practitioner of power, is then something sort of lost there? I mean, there certainly seemed to be a tension between Kissinger once he was in power, once he joined Nixon and improbably because he was, you know, started out as the kind of advisor to Nelson Rockefeller and the Eastern establishment, all of that. But anyway, he moves into his position of power, the national security advisor. And then we see all these tensions that seem to crop up with his former colleagues at Harvard. Is that just primarily ideological, do you think? I mean, Henry is now adjusting himself to an entirely new world and adapting to it, it seems extremely well. Well, that's why I paused and, and, you know, when you asked me that question, because there's no question that Kissinger at Harvard was an intellectual. And the books he writes before he goes to Washington are books that any um, um, intellectual with an interest in European history can savor. Um, but once he goes to Washington, um, he does something that few intellectuals are able to do, and that is to take the ideas that he's had and apply them in the real world where there are real consequences. And um, Kissinger himself said that once he, he went to Washington, um, he could only draw on the intellectual capital he all, already had because there was simply no time to... Um, reflect and cogitate and read and build up new intellectual ca capital. So he was relying on what he already had. Um, now, what did happen and was the height of Vietnam, um, 
a group of his Harvard friends, uh, including very prominent people like, well, I don't know that your listeners will know who Thomas Schelling is, but he was a major, Sharp. major thinker Game on theory. strategy, won the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, others like Michael Walzer, I forget who the other, I think Stanley Hoffman was among them. And they came to plead with Kissinger um, to really let up on 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 the Nixon uh, Vietnam policy. And um, he said after the meeting that 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 was the meeting that finally severed his ties with the I forget if he said with the academic community or with the intellectual yes, community. Yes, um, it's hard but, not to see that as as faded as as well. And and. You refer, it, I recently read a biography of, of Bismarck, which was all about how Bismarck knew he had to cultivate, you know, the, the king, essentially the monarch, or he was essentially not, not, nothing. And Kissinger, uh, maybe this is part of the transition, he realized without the support of the president, he too essentially was nothing. And so once you've made that kind of a, a pivot, uh, I would imagine that the intellectual world as we think of it, at least the ivory tower is is kind of well left behind. I mean, you're on a whole new voyage in your in your life. And I suppose his critics would say that he was corrupted by that voyage. But of course, they would say that because they're not really inhabiting the position that, that he's in. So they don't really have to make maybe some of those difficult ethical and moral choices that he had to make. They would say that he was corrupted. They would also say that he was an opportunist and he would do anything he could to cling to the, um, well, I don't know, the the, the shirt sleeves of, of, of power. Um, there is clearly an element of the opportunist in him. That there's no doubt about. And you can criticize that as a character flaw, um, but that's not all there was. And um, um, the man, the, the friend who understood this, who understood that um, operating with power was a very different kind of thing from operating with ideas, uh, was Hans Morgenthau. And what happened in their history together was they were very close. As I say, Morgenthau was a mentor to the younger Kissinger. Vietnam came. Uh, Kissinger was the leading implementer of it. Morgenthau became one of the, if not the most influential critics of the Vietnam War. And there were inevitable tensions between them. But Morgenthau always understood that Kissinger was operating far from the ivory tower and had to make choices that were very difficult and that couldn't be handled by theoretical academicians. And after the war um, ended, they became close friends again. There's one more thing I want to say about Kissinger, the intellectual. Once he was out of power, he wrote and continues to write. He's 100 years old, and as I understand it, is writing two books at the moment. Um, that um, he wrote a series of books that really, again, show his intellectual acumen. I mean, I, the book that I think is his masterwork is called Diplomacy, came out in 1985, and it's a combination of history and practical applications of history. So he's able to draw on his own experiences, both as a, uh, an official and as a, a scholar. Um, so I, I think, um, I would say there's no question that he is an intellectual, though during his years in public service, he had to uh, play that down. He also had to play it down because Nixon was such an anti-intellectual. <laughs> It's and so right. there was that as well. well. Yeah, Nixon is that's a whole nother. I can't, can't, yeah, that's a whole can of words. Yeah. Um, Kissinger, I mean, what's interesting to me as well, I mean, and we're going to get into the, you know, we can get into it now if you want, but the, the, the sort of criticism that he gets from the, let's say, the Christopher Hitchens school with, you know, the man is a war criminal. Uh, and the man was uh, more gently a amoral, if not immoral, a amoral. And I think you formulate a kind of an interesting response to that. As I understand, Kissinger, at least in his own mind, 
uh, understood sort of classical values like order and justice. And there's a deep school of thought that applies to international relations that order is prior to justice. And it's a value in its own right. It may be downplayed by a lot of people, including in the sort of social justice circles, but is Kissinger's embrace of, of order, which he thought could be achieved by balance of power, in itself a value? And was that something that he sincerely felt, in part, as I suppose, as a consequence of what he had observed about Weimar, about, you know, in Hitler's uh, Germany? You're absolutely right. And, you know, as I say, one of my closest friends and many of my other friends view him as a war criminal and can't get beyond that. But the philosophical issue you raise is exactly the right one, which is um, the belief that before there can be justice, there has to be order, that people will choose order over justice for their own lives and their own security. And to go around the world preaching justice, preaching an abstraction, um, is really not a very efficacious way to handle foreign policy. Um, and that can be called um, amoral or immoral, though as Kissinger himself responded, what's immoral about trying to strive for world peace? And, um, and he did feel that the opponents who had all of their moral objections, he called them crusaders. And he said that um, uh, if you pursue justice without order, you get neither. Um, what you get is um, Syria, or I mean, he didn't say Syria, but what you get is, is, is chaos because you can't impose justice or have justice unless you've imposed order. Um, uh, I, I want to add, all of this is in, in Morgenthau as well, and if anyone is interested in pursuing the philosophical foundations of Kissinger's foreign policy and what I believe is should be the real foundation of American foreign policy, um, you do well to read some of Morgenthau, including, as you mentioned, politics among nations, um, that... Um, the pursuit of justice without power leaves you powerless. Right. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to propose just about a two minute uh, break. Uh, okay. I'm going to get a glass of water yourself. I'm just going to uh, pause. However, you want to do it. So, as part of being an intellectual, uh, Henry Kissinger was in his role as a professor, very much of an educator. And I think that informed, I mean, in your book, it's it's clear that's part of what was propelling him as a writer. And it wasn't just a, a sort of a, a vanity exercise. I mean, he was deeply immersed, not just in his record, but in a kind of set of ideas about how he regarded the practice of, of power. And his mission was to help educate Americans, American citizens in realism and what he meant by that and how that was important. And in opposition to what you describe as sort of the Wilsonian uh, ethos and more idealistic or crus crusading idea, you know, making the world safe for democracy. Um, I kept wondering, though, even though he's persisted to this, was it a complete failure? I mean, have Americans really ever caught to realism? Some might say that's just it may be continental European, but it's just antithetical to the American experience. Um, that certainly has been a criticism that's been made of um, Kissinger and other realists, um, German Jewish realists, particularly Morgenthau. Um, there's an element of truth to that. But again, the truth is one that has to be very uh, strongly qualified and hedge. America really was blessed in the first, oh, 150 years of its history as a nation because it, it was able to become the great power in the Western Hemisphere because it never had to deal with European or Asian, but especially European, Politics. It never had to deal with the kinds of contradictions that foreign policy necessarily 
uh, brought out. Um, I'll mention that my title, The Inevitability of Tragedy, comes from something that um, Kissinger said, but it could also have been said by uh, Morgenthau, which is that in foreign policy, um, you can't simply apply moral principles to a, a um, contradictory situation that's constantly in flux. You really have to go in with a, a sense of your own identity, your own identity as a nation. And even then, you're going to be faced with choices between the bad and the less bad, that it's almost impossible in the conduct of foreign policy not to, in, in, at some point, um, inflict damage on innocents, kill children. That, that it, you can't criticize foreign policy if, if civilians die. Um, this gets very complicated, but the, uh, the perspective of realists like Kissinger and Morgenthau is that, again, uh, if you apply moral principles as your foundation, that's not to say that moral principles don't come in at a later stage. Uh, it may be necessary to kill your enemy, but if you go ahead and commit genocide, one can make a legitimate moral argument against that because genocide was not necessary to achieve your military and political aims. Um, again, these things are all to be argued and discussed in classrooms and, and foundations and the like. But for Kissinger, there was no question that a Wilsonian dependence on morality uh, in a world that was not moral would lead you into grave, grave difficulties. Yeah, and that was right. And and it, and he's, you know, one could say this about Henry Kissinger, he has been con consistent in, in the sense that, you know, the neoconservatives who were in very many ways pitted against him are, are sort of famously described as the, you know, the the Trotsky uh, types that, that got, you know, mugged by reality or the liberals that got mugged by reality. In the case of Henry Kissinger, I'm impressed by his consistency in terms of the realist ideas and his interpretations of them and what he thought they offered to the American experience. How does his realism and how is his thinking now being applied to, let's say, two sets of, of big issues? One is China, uh, and he recently visited China. And of course, he and Nixon pulled off one of the great diplomatic coups of modern American foreign policy times in the opening to China that they pursued. So China, and secondly, uh, Russia and Ukraine and that whole set of issues. Why don't we start with China? Um, Kissinger recently visited China. He received an incredibly warm reception. Um, I want to throw in a personal anecdote here. Um, my book, while it has its criticisms of Kissinger, is basically um, a pro-Kissinger book. Um, and the Chinese, according to my publisher, were interested in publishing it in China. Um, but they came back to my publisher and said, I mean, in my book, I'm very critical of communism per se, no surprise, but um, the Chinese wanted those sections removed. And of course I wouldn't do that. So um, uh, the, the Chinese population does not have the opportunity to uh, read my book unless they know English and smuggle it in. Um, um, so um, I, I, that's just a personal aside, but in terms of um, Kissinger's visit to China, one thing it reminds me of is early in his career, Trump had Kissinger to the White House, and there's a photo of them together. And um, he, he, Kissinger was criticized for that. Um, and um, how could he visit so such a scoundrel? And Kissinger's response would be the same response that um, he might give uh, about the China visit, which is um, government exists. 
power exists, it's never not going to exist. And so if you want to have an impact on policy decisions, you have to d- confer with um, uh, people who may be villains in history. Uh, it doesn't mean you will have an impact, but not talking to them is a sure way not to have an impact. Um, and um, in China, for instance, with the China opening, there were right-wingers, I think Pat Buchanan was among them, who said, how dare you uh, reach an agreement with a man who has the blood of, what was it, 50 million people on his hands? Well, for Kissinger and for Nixon, uh, Mao may have been a fanatic in that regard, but he existed in the real world. And you couldn't talk, you couldn't avoid dealing with him. And if you refused to talk to him, you were you were engaging in foreign policy with one, if not both hands tied behind your back because the opening to China allowed the United States to play off Russia against China, which increased its own um, uh, uh, position in the world, not to mention its own national security. And if you just uh, made your decisions based on your moral revulsion of a particular regime, you were hurting yourself. So with regard to China, uh, I think he's taken criticism uh, for being too nice to the Chinese. But Kissinger, Kissinger's book on China is well worth reading. And to get back just for a moment to Kissinger the intellectual, a lot of these books that he's written after um, leaving office are very solid and very well thought through. And if if the definition of an intellectual is to write good books, Kissinger is an intellectual for having written good books. His view of China and the U.S. is that both countries are naive. They've both been able to live pretty much in their own spheres without ever having to deal with the rest of the world. And now they're caught having to deal with the rest of the world, and each of them in its own way is ill-equipped. And so... So for Kissinger, it's important to create that dialogue. Kissinger is very much a man of peace. I mean, and I know this sounds odd to people who view him as the villain of Vietnam or the man who overthrew Allende in Chile, but his, his ultimate goal is always maximizing the possibilities for world peace. And right now, he's very concerned that the US and China will end up in, in some sort of bellicose situation because of a lack of understanding. So what he can provide or what diplomats can provide is the understanding with both, which both of these superpowers need if there's going to be a world of peace. Well, how does, uh, on, Ty- on China, how does the then Taiwan fit into that? You know, I, I haven't seen his comments on Taiwan Um I'm not really prepared to discuss that, Uh, but I would think if we look at how he handled Vietnam, um, he very much resisted, and and Nixon did too, of course, an immediate withdrawal. They, They both, when they took office, understood that Vietnam was a colossal mistake. Um, But they also believed that for the sake of um, um, national prestige, uh, you couldn't simply withdraw and and leave your allies, the South Vietnamese, to the tender mercies of the North Vietnamese communists. There had to be um, some sort of public agreement. And we can argue about what that meant. Um, In some ways, it really was um, um, hypocrisy. But as uh, La Rochefoucauld would say, hypocrisy is not the worst sin in in the world, especially in foreign policy. Um, And my guess would be that on Taiwan, he would tell the Chinese, 
there is no way that the U.S. can simply abandon Taiwan. The U.S. policy has always been what it was when we set it up with Mao, which is to say that eventually Taiwan would be incorporated into China peacefully. But if China exercises military power to force Taiwan into China, the U.S. would have to stand up, for, if only for its own prestige and security, to oppose that. That would be my guess on what right. his would say. And to segue then, Russia and Ukraine. Um, that's very interesting. And I have found myself um, almost you know, um, astonishingly following Kissinger in his twists and turns there. Um, uh, I, like just about everyone else, felt that when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was a, a disastrous error on Putin's part, but that he would march into Kiev in a matter of days. Um, that was the general feeling, and I assume that Kissinger... Uh, also shared that feeling. When that didn't happen, um, um, uh, and the war proceeded the way it has dragged on, um, Kissinger had been opposed to offering Ukraine membership in NATO. Um, and I similarly had opposed it. I just didn't see why Americans would want to fight a, a war, possibly a nuclear war, with Russia over Ukraine, which most of them couldn't locate on a map. And um, um, and my position had been, and I again assume it was Kissinger's position, to support the heroic Ukrainians, how could you not, but not to offer them NATO membership, because that would involve uh, the U.S., in Eastern European politics, for which it was unequipped both intellectually and militarily to um, uh, engage in. Um, Kissinger has since changed his mind, as I should add, has the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Both now feel that uh, Ukraine should enter NATO. And I've been persuaded, uh, I, I haven't really heard Macron's arguments, but I imagine they're the same as um, Kissinger's. Um, uh, I've been persuaded. Kissinger has offered uh, typically a realpolitik reason why Ukraine should uh, join NATO. And it's not that we are spreading democracy around the world. This may be the policy, poli uh, the policy of, say, Tim Snyder or Ann Applebaum, but this is not Kissinger's view. Kissinger's view is you, that you don't want a, however the war ends, you don't want a country that is uh, militarily experienced, has enormous amounts of weaponry and trained personnel just sitting there outside any connection to, to anything. Um, and it would be better for Ukraine to be attached to NATO than to be dissociated and confronting Russia on its own. I would add, it's something I'm working on now, I would add, and I suspect Kissinger has this in mind as well, that um, if Ukraine is on its own without a connection to the West and with Russia always looming over it, that it would be a prime candidate to develop nuclear weapons. And um, uh, this would be on Kissinger's mind. Um, Again, it's a realpolitik way of looking at it. Not that we're doing the work of the angels by spreading democracy, but we're doing the work of the diplomats by finding a way to avoid Ukraine having to face an, another war with Russia or uh, developing nuclear weapons. So um, uh, the Kissinger's position is now uh, Ukraine should join NATO. But out, out of his own... Uh, real politic thinking as ever as ever and i think anybody who who reads this book uh the inevitability of tragedy henry kissinger in his world will understand why that is 
his position. And that is why people should read this book. I found it a tremendously uh, immersive read. Thank you. Uh, I think it develops Henry Kissinger in a way that is not so familiar to readers of standard uh, biographies, including ones that he uh, or the one that he authorized. And so this is a valuable contribution to the literature. I want to thank you, Barry, uh, for your time and thoughts today. And that will be it for this uh, episode of America and Beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.